All right. Hello, everyone. Um, OK, uh, my name is Alex Andoni. Uh, and I'm uh, here myself too much. Um, lower, right? OK, uh, this is a little better. Sorry, just very weird to hear yourself. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about uh, algorithmic uh, topics. Uh, so I'll talk about you know, formally tools called algorithmic applications of high dimensional geometry. Uh, it will connect uh, very well to Yarek's uh, uh, lectures, um, though mine will be much more hand wavy. Um, and uh, uh, you should think about, you know, this is, this is part kind of like more of a kind of machine learning statistical uh, bootcamp. I'll mostly talk about algorithms. Okay, so think about this, you know, what really I'm about is about making algorithms more efficient. So this is what we'll be talking about and how we'll be using high dimensional geometry, in particular high dimensional uh, geometry techniques to make algorithms more efficiently. Okay, so, you know, to get a little bit uh, more, uh, you know, to get hands dirty a little bit, uh, here is an example problem. Um, um, finding similar pairs, uh, similarity search, um, also, uh, basically, the problem of nearest neighbor search. Uh, and, uh, you know, it can be kind of at a very high level. It can be described as follows. You have a bunch of objects like images. This is, you know, a bunch of images taken from ImageNet. Uh, but you can imagine, you know, a bunch of images and you want to find similar, uh, similar ones. Right? Uh, this is, you know, maybe you want to do the duplication or you want uh, to cluster somehow your images. And there are many, many applications. We'll return to this problem uh, a little bit later tomorrow. Um, but, you know, you want to solve this. And how to solve this efficiently? Uh, so normally, kind of, you know, how do you do it? Well, you enumerate over all pairs of images, compare, you know, check if they are similar or not. And, you know, this is how we do it. So if we have n images, uh, then the number of you know, computational time uh, or effort will be <coughs> proportional to the number of images squared. So n squared times perhaps the time it takes to actually compare two images, right? And uh, let me just, you know, write this once on the board. Um, usually throughout my lectures, I'll denote by n to be number of objects or, you, or points, um, and d will be the dimension, okay? So we'll return, uh, return to this. Um, and uh, I, I use these letters uh, or mention them now because, you know, in other uh, literature, in particular in statistics, P is what, you know, would, be re would, re would represent the dimension, okay? Uh, so think about, you know, dimension is kind of description complexity of an image and so forth, okay? So we'll, we'll uh, you know, define things formally. Um, but, you know, n will be the number of objects, right? So this problem is you know, solvable in n squared time, uh, but can we do better? Okay, and uh, generally, can, again, this is, you know, again, kind of very high level description or, or goal um, is that, you know, traditional algorithm design was kind of, you know, you have some, you know, uh, problem to be solved, you have some computational resource, you know, computer, you have data set, and, you know, you take a classic algorithm from, for example, from, you know, our uh, 4231 class, Okay, you plug an algorithm from here and you apply it to, you, to your data set and you, know, you, you, you get some runtime, right? And, um, okay, and the golden, golden standard kind of, right, on the way we kind of, is, the, 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 the book describes uh, is that, well, you know, we want, generally speaking, an algorithm which is polynomial time, right? There's kind of a big chasm between polynomial time or, or more, uh, but this is kind of a golden standard. Okay, now, um, so this is, this is what we call VR as efficient algorithm. Right? Of course, today this is, you know, and the runtime kind of for the previous problem for the similarity search is basically n squared, you know, times the time it takes to compare actually two images. Okay, of course, you know, today the world looks more like, okay, uh, like this, right? Our data set is, is very, very large now. And uh, perhaps something like order n squared time is not good enough. Okay, so in particular, if the number of images is a billion, right, which is a very reasonable number nowadays, uh, you know, billion squared is a little bit too much. Okay, so we really can't afford polynomial time anymore. Okay, so the, the standard algorithms or kind of standard al kind of algorithmic thinking doesn't necessarily apply. And the way we think about the problem is a little bit differently, right? We, we switch things around and say, not, a, not 
you know, rather than asking, you know, what can you do, you know, given a problem, what is the best runtime, rather want to ask is, you know, this is a bound on computational resources, you know, let's say linear in the data set size, what is the best thing we can do in that amount of time? Okay, so, you know, as this phrase suggests. Um, and uh, so kind of a modern algorithmic design is, you know, the new goal is, you know, to get time which is as close as possible to linear time, linear in the size of the data set, you know, sometimes we can consider things which are even less than uh, linear time. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, you know, we want time which is more like order n. Um, and, uh, you know, how will we, you know, how can we do this kind of, you know, obviously, you know, we, we need to kind of relax something or do something. And kind of one common approach, and this is pretty much will be the theme or kind of underlying assumption or, you know, thought process in designing the algorithms that I'm presenting in this lecture is, is follows that rather than taking kind of a running the algorithm on the entire data set, which is kind of, you know, big, we'll try to represent this data set uh, by something which is much more manageable. You think about kind of smaller. Uh, and instead of kind of running the algorithm on the entire data set, you know, you'd, you'd run your algorithm on this kind of smaller data set. Now, you know, of course you cannot compress the data set kind of immediately. So all this kind of, you know, representing the data set by something smaller, we want, uh, we, we want that it approximates the properties of these. And usually the, the way to achieve this will, you know, will be by introducing approximation and randomization. Okay, and you have seen these things in the previous lectures already. Okay, so this will be kind of the general theme. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I should mention that uh, oftentimes, you know, we'll, you know, not think only about time. You know, you might care about other resources, for example, space consumed by the algorithm uh, or perhaps communication. Uh, maybe this is, you know, run on multiple computers and so forth. So there are many applications. I mean, we, we will see some of them. Okay, and, you know, okay, you know, that sounds all good kind of, right? I mean, how are we to do this? Um, well, you know, let, let, let's start with, you know, again, continue with this example of similarity search. Uh, well, you know, the first thing for us to talk about is, okay, we have images, you know, somehow we need to define how we compare them, right? So I just took simpler images, which are from simpler data set, I guess I missed. Um, so first question is, how do we even compare images? Okay, how do we even represent them kind of mathematically? Uh, well, you know, a natural way is to kind of, for example, for images is to think about them as, you know, if there is, let's say, a 20 by 20 image, uh, which is binary, then, you know, represent by a vector which has 400 dimensions where we have a coordinate for each pixel and it's zero or one depending whether this pixel is set or not. Okay, so then comparing two images, you know, we can just compute Hamming distance or the number of different coordinates between these two representations. Okay, I mean, this is very, very naive kind of, uh, way to represent, and you know, indeed, there are kind of more fancy ones. But you know, think about this as kind of you know, the, the, you know, the, the zero step kind of, and try to thinking about you know how to represent such images. Okay, and you know, I should mention you know these, uh, for example, for similarity search, there are classical algorithms which will try to do this. But usually, they will have either this n squared times you know the time it takes to to compare two images. Uh, but if you want faster. Uh, then you can do this really only in smaller dimensions. So if your dimension is very small, so then this number of pixels is very small, then you can do it faster and the runtime will be something like at least n times two to the power omega d. Again, depending on, you know, this Hamming distance or Euclidean distance and so forth. But usually the classical algorithms kind of, you know, from, from the textbook will degrade exponentially the dimension. So as soon as the dimension of the images are you know, already like 20 by 20 and you have 400 dimensional vectors and, you know, two to 400 is just not doable, right? This is, you can't use such algorithms, okay? But what can you do? Uh, well, you know, you have seen previous lectures. Uh, so, you know, the, the notion of kind of dimension reduction. And uh, one thing kind of to speed up at least the, the comparison of two images is to, uh, perhaps sample coordinates to compare these two images, right? This is, this is actually dimension reduction. It is kind of very, very, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a basic way to do it, let's say in Hamming space, right? So this is kind of a simplification of, uh, of what uh, Yarik was talking about. 
Okay, so you sample a few coordinates, you compare and these few coordinates, these are the red coordinates are the ones that we sampled, you know, they should be the same in the, in the two images. And uh, you compute how many different uh, coordinates are there in these sample coordinates, and you know, you kind of expect by some kind of concentration that, uh, you know, this, this information will approximate what is the number of different coordinates in the entire vector. So, you know, these, the Hamming distance in the sample coordinates will approximate the Hamming distance between uh, original vectors. Okay, and this is an example of uh, dimension reduction, and um, uh, and, and you know the, the, the types of properties that it has is that it is a compression, right? So it goes from high dimension to low dimension, basically from you know many bits to just you know these red a few bits, okay? And it is good for a particular task, as in this this kind of dimension reduction is particular. It's good for comparing, for estimating the distance between two vectors. Okay, it is not good, for example, you know, for finding, you know, the first bit, you know, maybe we just didn't sample it, right? So this, this is kind of a, a, a compression, which is functional compression, because it is really with a particular task in mind. Okay, and, you know, uh, intuitively, you know, it is almost always lost, yes? and we'll lose some information, because we're just preparing for a particular task, and this will be some approximation. Okay, so, uh, you know, nowadays, you know, again, I mentioned that, you know, this is kind of a very, very, you know, basic representation of images. Nowadays, you know, this is not how you kind of represent mathematically the images. You know, mostly what you'll do, you'll t actually, you'll do an image, you'll pass it through a block, black box, right? And it will give you some vectors. Uh, this is so slow. Uh, some vectors. Now, you know, these are really, um, I am only half joking. I mean, these are really uh, the black boxes. You know, the, uh, you can pass them through deep learning layers, and if you look at the penultimate layer, uh, layer of a uh, deep learned kind of network, then it will give you good uh, embeddings of these of images into Euclidean space, so that the distance or kind of geometric relation between vectors is a good representation of the similarity of the two images. Okay, but again, you know, these lectures are not about that. Uh, is, uh, these lectures are about that after you've do, done this representation of the images in some particular way, at the end of the day, you get some vectors, some dimensional vectors. Either, you know, these, these were kind of Hamming vectors or Euclidean vectors, but at the end of the day, you get some vectors. They're high, always high dimensional, and their kind of geometry or distance represents some kind of information uh, between images, right? So. The Euclidean distance between vectors is some approximation of the similarity between uh, images or dissimilarity, to be precise. Okay, so for Euclidean vectors, you know, dimension reduction looks a little, you know, is, is, you know, is not perhaps as simple, but still relatively simple. You have seen it earlier today, uh, in particular the Johnson Lenschau's dimension reduction, uh, which you know basically just introduced notation, but I'll be using this in this. Uh, Lectures, uh, it is a map or function. Uh, it is actually linear uh, that maps uh, from an uh, n dimensional, uh, call it d dimensional, um, but high dimensional space into, say, k dimensional space. This is the target dimension, such that for any two points, uh, the, the distance in the target space. Uh, well approximates the original distance up to one plus, uh, plus minus epsilon approximation with some probability. So this is the distribution of Johnson Lee Strauss. And uh, uh, you can take this S to be a Gaussian matrix. So it is a matrix which is in this case K by N uh, and each entry is ID Gaussian. And uh, to get that guarantee, it is enough to set K to be equal to that. Okay, so at least you know, what you can do is, you know, for this similar research kind of problem, what you can do is at least comparing two images, you know, perhaps can be improved a little bit. Okay, so you first can do dimension reduction on all the images, and then to compare, you know, when you uh, iterate over all pairs of images, at least you can compute the distance between dimension reduced vectors spinning on the process. Okay, we'll see kind of, you know, algorithms which improve much more than this, in particular, we improve over the n squared uh, factor. Uh, but, you know, this is just to give you a flavor of, uh, of things to come. Okay, and generally speaking, you know, this is, kind of, uh, again, an example of so dimension reduction is an example of, you know, what, you know, what I call efficient representation uh, of, of data. And, you know, usually using these high-dimensional geometric tools. Okay, and this efficient representation, 
which in this case really means, you know, we've taken from high dimensional vectors into lower dimensional vectors, which approximate the distances approximately. Okay, we'll use this efficient representation to get fast algorithms, right? This is kind of the, you know, when I was talking about kind of modern algorithmic design, this is, you know, kind of one facet of this, right? This is how we'll be getting these faster algorithms, okay? Uh, and again, you know, I'm mentioning that, you know, sometimes we want to, we care about other resources, you know, these kind of tools are also good uh, and sometimes designed specifically for optimizing other resources, for example, space, okay? All right, so this is kind of introduction, you know, just to give you a flavor of what it is really about these lectures. Uh, and, uh, you know, here is the plan of uh, what we'll be talking in the three lectures. Uh, so today we'll, talk, we'll be talking about kind of dimension reduction and its applications to numerical, numerical linear algebra. Uh, this will be, again, very close to what uh, Yarex uh, was talking earlier in lectures today. Um, I might be repeating a few things there, but again, it'll be at very high level. Um, uh, and uh, basically tomorrow we'll see, you know, these other topics, uh, sketching, streaming, space partitions for nearest neighbor search. In particular, this is the, the problem that we started with, right? This is similarity search and more. Okay, so... Um, okay, so dimension reduction, again, you know, this is just, uh, just a repeat of what you have seen already, right? This is dimension reduction. Uh, and uh, where just a little shows where our map uh, is just a linear map, it will multiply by a Gaussian matrix, and uh, the type of concentration that you get, so you get uh, approximation one plus minus epsilon uh, for, uh, for uh, if you reduce, you know, if your dimension, if, if your dimension reduction reduces to uh, Euclidean space of dimension K, then your failure probability for a particular pair of points P and Q will be something like e to minus basically inversely exponential in epsilon squared times Q. Okay, and I believe you mentioned that kind of one natural application is that if you have, let's say, capital N points and you want to, uh, you, you want to preserve the distances between all these points, you can apply dimension reduction. Uh, and, you know, for this, you'll need to set k to be roughly log n by epsilon squared. Okay, in particular, it doesn't depend on the original dimension, which is this little n. Okay. So, uh, you know, this is just setting up notation, so hopefully everything is clear. Okay, so uh, numerical linear algebra, uh, so the, the, the problem, you know, the first problem that we'll, we'll see uh, and talk about in, in kind of a little bit more detail is least square regression. And we'll see how, you know, this high dimension reduction, the tool from high dimensional geometry, is useful for speeding up this problem. Okay, um, yeah, did, did you cover, uh, did you? I see, okay, cool, okay, so this is uh, like, Perfect, okay. Um, all right, so least, least square regression, um, and you know, this is kind of, perhaps one of the kind of, you know, machine learning tool 101, and uh, so, you know, uh, you want to make it fast. Um, so we have, uh, we have a matrix A, which has dimension N by D. You can think about each row of A as being, let's say, a point. Okay, and you want to kind of, you know, find linear model for it, right? X will be this kind of, uh, the parameters of the linear model, and uh, you know what what it really means that you want to find some vector x such that a x minus b is minimized. Okay, so you want to find vector x which best describes the the uh, basically the the points uh, a. Um, okay, so uh, assuming that that b is obtained from a kind of linearly, plus we have some noise. Right? I mean, basically, least square regression comes out from some uh, maxim maximum likelihood estimator uh, problem where the, the model is linear, okay? Again, we don't care, but we won't talk about, you know, where the problem comes from. We just care, you know, here's the problem. We want to solve it as quickly as possible. Okay, so this is the problem. Uh, and uh, we'll think about n, the number of rows of the matrix A and, and uh, dimension of vector B as being much larger than D. This is kind of the natural situation. You think about rows of A as being the, you know, data, you know, the, the size of your data set, how many points you have in the data set, 
and d is the dimension of a number of parameters, right? The, the, the p in I guess statistical literature. Um, okay, and it will be okay to solve this not exactly but approximately. Okay, uh, mostly because you know why approximately because well we don't know how to compute it faster exactly, so we'll settle for approximation. Okay, and uh, just you know pictorially, uh, this is you know, this is how the problem looks like. We have a matrix; it is a tall, skinny matrix, and we want to find x, which is again has a dimension d, so as to minimize the L2 norm, right? This, the, the, the norm of AX minus B. Okay, so uh, exactly, you know, how do you solve this problem exactly? Well, you can do, let's say, in SVD decomposition, and, uh, you know, the, the time it will take is basically if you are to use fast matrix multiplication, right, which, you know, you may or may not use. Uh, the runtime will be something like n times d to omega minus one, right? Omega is the exponent of matrix multiplication. I uh, think it is 2.373, kind of the best one theoretically, but you know, probably in practice you'll think of omega as being free. So this will be n d squared. You know, theoretically this is the best runtime. Okay, so we'll want to speed up. This is kind of our baseline that we want to, uh, to speed up. So we'll want a faster algorithm. Okay, so how will we do it? Okay, again, this is, this is our problem. Um, okay, so, you know, what, what is, you know, I already suggested that we'll be using dimension reduction for this. How, how are we using dimension reduction? What is the connection of dimension reduction? Well, this problem, okay, there is some mark min or something, right? But at the end of the day, what we are computing is L2 distance between A for fixed X, we're computing L2 distance between A times X and B. Right? So pictorially, we are computing the distance between this vector and this vector. Okay? They are very high dimensional vectors, they're n-dimensional vectors. So maybe we can somehow apply dimension reduction to these vectors to reduce dimension, and maybe this will be useful for us. Okay? So indeed, uh, the the idea would be to try to use dimension reduction first to reduce it to a smaller problem and then solve the smaller problem. Okay? Uh, so I'll call it reduce, and, reduce dimension and solve. Well, you know, originally it is called sketch and solve. Uh, but we haven't defined sketch yet. Uh, but, you know, this is kind of reduce dimension and solve. That's how we call it. Okay? So here is the idea. Uh, we we will, you know, so this is high dimensional vector, this is high dimensional vector. Maybe we apply dimension reduction to these high dimensional vectors. Okay, and reduce the problem. Okay, so um, again, remember S is a linear map. Just Strauss is a linear map. So when we compute the norm of AX minus B, we can apply kind of the uh, dimension reduction to this difference. Uh, or equivalently, it is we apply dimension reduction to AX independently and dimension reduction to B independently. Right, S is literally a matrix, right? So this is uh, just using linearity. Okay, so, uh, so what have we achieved, right? So we, we reduce, kind of reduce this dimension, now we reduce to here. Now, what we have is that S is a matrix, A is a matrix, as again, this is the same matrix, this is a vector. We can compute as A first. We can compute as B first uh, as well at the beginning. Okay? And then the, the dimension, the kind of output dimension of this matrix S is, is K, which we think about much smaller than the original dimension. So this means that if we compute as A first, right, and as B first, then and you know the dimension, the, this, this dimension, the output dimension is only k. Then we've reduced to a much smaller dimension. So we started from a dimension where, from a problem where matrix A was of size n by d. We've reduced it to size k by d now. Okay, is this okay? And so we do this, right? I mean, x is kind of still there. We still need to minimize over all x's. Uh, so the new problem becomes to compute the argmin of this, 
and let's call this x prime, right? This is not exactly the same as, as x star, uh, but we'll call it x prime. And what we hope is that when you compute this x prime, so the optimal solution of this dimension reduced problem should roughly approximate, you know, the value for the original problem. Okay, no, note that, by the way, what does this approximation mean? Note that x star is optimizer for this. So x prime, you know, this value can only be equal or bigger than this quantity. Okay, I should also mention from the beginning that what we are, we are not approximating x star. We are, op we are finding another x prime, which is, uh, which approximates the, the objective value. Right? This is the objective value up to a factor of one plus epsilon. So, it, it, you know, x prime could be close, may or may not be close to x star itself. Okay, and so this is, this is the approach, is that, is that clear? Okay. Yes. That's not a constant, though, is it? It will not be a constant, yes, yes, yes. You know, what should be the right k, right? That, that's a good question. Um, and um, we have, you know, we got to use what properties the dimension reduction satisfies, right? So what, uh, what properties does it satisfy? Well, for any vector, right, the dimension reduction will approximate the original, so the L2 of the dimension reduced vector will approximate the L2 of the original vector, in this case, Ax minus B, with probability, uh, you know, one minus the failure probability, where failure probability is, again, inversely exponential in epsilon squared and target dimension for any X. You know, I, we hopefully k will be much smaller than n, right? The, the original dimension, the, le the left side of the matrix. Say. What should k be? Where, you know, is, is there any issue with this approach so far? Sorry, I, I, um, I know it's late in the day, but you know, hopefully there's you know, slides and nice pictures and, and boxes, right? It's, right. Right. Right, right. So, yeah, good point. Yeah, you're, you're getting at exactly what I wanted you guys to get to. Namely, uh, uh, sorry. Um, namely, I mean, what do we want, right? I mean, we want that, uh, I mean, it, it's okay, but this is, you know, this is true. In particular, this, this approximation will be true for our X star. Okay, so that's okay. Now the issue is that we don't want that anything else becomes kind of that, that this value after we do the dimension reduction suddenly drops below a lot just because it is an error and therefore x prime is, you know, has a very different uh, value. As in this, this value is actually much higher than, it, uh, than we expect it to be. Put differently, uh, the number of, I mean, we could kind of set this probability to be, or this probability to be low enough so that we can, let's say, union bound over all possible axes. Okay, the issue is that, in a sense, this is not good enough because by default there could be many possible axes, right? I mean, we're doing arg min over x, which is a d-dimensional vector, we, you know, there are infinite number of points there. Okay, so, uh, you know, it, it, is, we, it is, this probability is not enough to do union bound over all possible axes, okay? And uh, so it can happen that, supposedly, that for some x, the, the dimension reduced, so some, you know, some kind of spooky x, when we uh, apply dimension reduction, the value, this value, the L2 norm after this dimension, uh, applying dimension reduction is much smaller than what it really is before dimension reduction. So that x will be chosen as kind of, optimizer of this argmin, okay? 
uh, in particular, it will be it will look like much smaller than the optimal value, whereas that x, the value for that x, you know, this quantity is actually much higher than the optimal value, just because the dimension reduction in a sense failed on that, uh, that x, right, to preserve the the, the distance. Okay, and um, right, so so you know, just using kind of standard dimension reduction is not good enough, uh, and you know, in fact, you have seen you know the tool that is good enough here. Um, and uh, the, the tool here is, you know, it's called oblivious subspace embedding. Think about this as, you know, it's a generalization of dimension reduction where we basically want, you know, before kind of, you know, kind of going for the definition, what we, really, what we really want from the dimension reduction to have a stronger property that is not only that this approximation doesn't hold for every particular X, with some good probability, but it holds for all axes. Right? But this approximation holds for all possible axes from the d-dimensional space. Okay, and this is, you know, this leads to this notion of oblivious subspace embedding. That was, you know, pretty much the, the motivation of, the, of this oblivious subspace embedding. Okay, but it is a linear map uh, that again maps kind of high-dimensional space into k-dimensional space such that you know, rather than just for any two fixed points, you now for any linear subspace P of dimension D, okay, we have that once you choose this S with pretty good probability, every point in this subspace will have its norm preserved. Okay, and you know, as you have seen in previous lectures, you can still take S to be Gaussian matrix. K will be a little bit uh, higher. In particular, it will depend linearly on this target dimension, on, on this dimension D, right? this dimension of the linear subspaces for which, you know, for which this definition holds. Okay, but we note that we expect this to, to happen for, uh, we expect that K should be at least linear in D. It cannot be less than D because, well, we take a linear subspace in D, we map it into lower dimensional space K, and we preserve all the distances in this dimension uh, fr from this original linear subspace D. Okay, we cannot, you know, since we're, we're preserving the entire D dimensional space there. Okay, so we cannot compress a D dimensional Euclidean space into lower dimensional Euclidean space. Okay, so you expect K to be at least D. Okay, but, you know, the, the problem is a little bit more complicated than just preserving a d-dimensional space into k-dimensional space. Okay, so therefore this is the bound that we get. Okay, so now it is enough because uh, now we, again, remember what we wanted is that this holds for every possible x. Okay, and indeed this will, you know, we, if s satisfies this property, then we take P, the subspace, to be all possible AX minus B, where X ranges in d dimensional space, right? All our parameter space, basically. Okay, so this is, note that this is a d dimensional subspace of an n dimensional space, right? So we have X, which is basically a d dimensional vector. You know, we do a linear transformation to it into n dimensional space. We get a d dimensional subspace of, of a, you know, high dimensional space, and uh, with constant probability, you know, now we can set delta to be, let's say, you know, 0 0.01, this will hold for all possible axes. You know, assuming S is successful, which happens with probability, you know, 0 0.99, let's say. Okay, so the overall algorithm then will be just Ignore this at the moment, but um, machine screwed up. But uh, the overall algorithm is again uh, we can. Sorry, this is very. Let me. This is. Okay, so uh, um, so we we compute a prime, which is dimension reduced matrix A. We compute B prime, which is dimension reduced uh, vector B, and then we solve 
arc beam, you know, as promised, uh, of A prime X minus B prime, okay? And, you know, this is, again, A prime, now the left dimension of A prime is instead of N, it's K. You know, we think of K as being now D by epsilon squared times log on over delta. You know, delta is a constant, so it's basically D by epsilon squared, which is independent of the original dimension N. So we've reduced from solving a, a problem where the, the matrix A was uh, from, of dimension N by D, it is now of dimension, basically, you know, for constant epsilon, it's of dimension D by D, okay? Now, you know, the only kind of, you know, the, the issue remaining is that, well, we need to compute this dimension reduced matrix A prime, so in compute, uh, compute this uh, multiplication S times A. Okay, what is the dimension of S? It's K by N. Dimension of A is N by D. Okay, so this is, you know, if you just apply matrix multiplication here, then it will take time, which is K times N times D, which, you know, since K is at least D, you know, times some factors, this will be at least time of N times D squared. Okay, so this runtime is no better than what we started with of doing is the decomposition of the matrix A at the beginning. Okay, precisely, and you know, just because even if we use fast mat mat matrix multiplication here, it will still be slower than the original algorithm. Okay, so this is slower than the original problem. So the idea would be to, instead of, you know, using the just kind of, in a sense, naive Gaussian matrix S to use matrix S, which is more structured still has these dimension reduction properties, in particular these oblivious subspace embedding properties, but is more structured so that multiplying by these matrices is much faster. And I mean, why do we hope to do this? Well, because S, the matrix S is in a sense under our control. So what we switched from at the beginning, you know, kind of computing, solving the problem exactly, we had the matrix A, we wanted to do something with the matrix A, uh, you, you know, uh, to do, let's say, SVD decomposition, but we did not have any control over matrix A. This was our input, okay? Here, you know, we switch to the problem of computing multiplication between a matrix S, this dimension reducing matrix S, and the original matrix A, but our, this matrix S is our, under our control, so we can design it as we want, okay? So this is, in a sense, you know, the progress that we've made. Okay, so now we can choose or design a matrix S which has more structure, so that multiplying by it is faster, uh, but still it preserves these kind of properties, okay? So, uh, this, this will be the fast Johnson and Schaus. I don't know if you mentioned these words in the... Okay, yeah. So this will be, this, I mean, this structured S, kind of, you know, jumping ahead, will be the fast Johnson and Schaus uh, lemma, or, you know, this fast construction of Johnson and Schaus, which we'll cover in, uh, in the next few slides. Uh, but just, you know, to finish with this problem, that once you design the structured S, eventually what, what you can get with these techniques is uh, runtime for the linear regression problem, which takes time which is proportional uh, to number of non-zeros in the matrix A, so you can do this, you know, with this, uh, this uh, dimension reducing matrix, you can design it so that multiplying by it takes time which is linear with the number of non-zeros of A, okay? Plus the time to solve the dimension reduced problem. Okay, so if you reduce, you know, what is the general approach, right? That we reduce to this smaller matrix A prime and then we solve linear regression uh, of dimension K by D, okay? Where K is something like linear in D, um, okay, so when you solve kind of a smaller dimensional linear regression problem, and you know, you, you'll get something which is polynomial in D by epsilon. Okay? But there is no factor of N here. Right? No, no dependence on the size of the matrix A. Okay, uh, so uh, in particular this also gets, you know, polynomial dependence in one over epsilon, which is not ideal. Uh, and it turns out that you kind of using certain kind of iterative methods, uh, so this is kind of more from kind of optimization literature kind of techniques uh, using uh, also some preconditioners. You can improve your dependence uh, on epsilon from polynomial in over epsilon to basically logarithmic in one over epsilon, okay, which is the type of dependence on one over epsilon you'd want. Okay, but again, you know, this is, you know, not, not what I'm going to talk about, but I, I'll, I will tell you about the structured uh, matrices. Okay, are there questions about this application so far?
Okay, so what, uh, so what, uh, what we'll be talking about is this uh, structured dimension reduction, uh, or you know, also called fast, uh, fast dimension reduction, fast GL. Um, so again, so far, and you can see, you know, for now you can forget even about oblivious subspace embedding. Uh, you can just think about kind of the standard uh, kind of distributional Jensen-Lee Schaus lemma. Okay, just because you can obtain oblivious subspace embedding, which is kind of from uh, f uh, from a matrix S or from some map S in a in a black box. Okay, so uh, all right. So so far, dimension reduction again, kind of you know standard jail kind of setting. Uh, roughly, this is how it looks like. Right? This is you know your 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 map. Uh, I'll call you know the input y just you know because our you know this corresponds to these vectors right a x minus b. This is what we do dimension reduction on. Okay, so we'll call that y, and you know we we'll think about if, you know uh, s is a map on y. Okay, so you know what it does is basically a Gaussian matrix of dimension k by n, uh, and you know there is some normalization factor of one over root k. Right, so that L two norm of this uh, is well uh, well approximates the L2 norm of Y. Okay, and uh, how much time does this take to compute for a particular vector? Right, Re remember, you know, if for linear regression, we'll be multiplying S by a matrix, which can be done by multiplying every uh, column of a matrix A. So let's just think about multiplying this matrix with applying this map S to one particular column of a matrix A. Right, this will be our vector Y. Okay, so, um, well, you know, it's a matrix, it's a dense matrix, so multiplying by a vector y will take time, which is n by times k. Okay, so we'll, we'll want to do this faster, and ideally, you know, to get, uh, to get the best result that I mentioned in the previous slide, we'd like a map S, which has the same kind of dimension reduction properties, but runs much faster. In particular, you know, ideally one can get something which runs in uh, time which is proportional to the number of non-zeros in Y, plus some polynomial in K. Okay, you know, of course we ideally want this polynomial in K to be as small as possible, but again, we don't want to depend, in, you know, even if Y is dense, let's say, and then, you know, it's, it's N and Z is equal to N, then, this is an improvement from n times k to n plus something which is polynomial in k, which again we think about as being much smaller than n, the number of data set points. Okay, and uh, what we'll see, or we, again, very hand wavy, it's late in the afternoon, um, an algorithm that will achieve runtime which is n log n, okay, this is the original dimension times you know, log original dimension plus k cubed. Okay, and this is, uh, due to a result uh, from 2006 uh, by Alon and Chazelle. Okay, and we call it fast GL transform. Okay, so <clears throat> again, so let's let's see. Um, so we have l let me call z to be this vector, you know, basically s of y, right? This dimension reduced. Um, Vector. Okay, and let's say we absorb this normalization factor into this matrix G. Okay, so you know why computing this Z, basically multiplication of the matrix G by Y, costly? Well, because okay, G comes from a distribution, but it's dense. So, was there a question? Or, no. um, because G is dense, right? So you know there is no way to uh, avoid looking at the entire matrix G. Okay, so. You know, a better approach would be to say, well, why do we choose this matrix G to be so dense? Maybe it's okay to take a matrix G, which has much fewer entries. So in a sense, well, maybe we take a Gaussian matrix, and then we zero out most of the matrix. Okay, or put differently, you know, let's say for every row, instead of, you know, having the entire kind of dense row of the matrix G, we just leave much fewer non-zero entries. Okay, these non-zero entries are still chosen from Gaussian distribution, so something like this, right? Uh, but there are very few non-zero entries per row. Okay, so we just choose G from a different distribution. Okay, and you know, let's say sample S entries per row. Okay, so let's do an analysis. You know, does, is this good enough? Okay, so let's do an analysis. 
Okay, so, you know, just to do this sampling, uh, let us introduce this uh, basically hash function H or, you know, function uh, that for every column, either n columns of this metric G, maps into zero one and basically, you know, one means that we, we keep that non-zero entry and zero means we don't, right? And let's say, you know, pretty much to, to do this process, um, approximately, uh, we'll choose each H of I independently IID with probability to be equal to one with probability S by N, right? So with an expectation we have S entries per row, okay? So then, you know, we can compute, right? So we're analyzing only one row. So let's go, you know, let's look at row number one, let's say, okay? So, you know, the first coordinate of the vector Z, Z1. Okay, so it will be equal to some eta. This will be the normalization constant. Uh, times, well, the, the product, right, this is, let's say, uh, j is the i is the entry in the matrix G, which is in the first row and the i column. Okay, and we'll multiply it by h of i, meaning whether we actually kept it or we zeroed it out. Okay, so this is just by definition of what we've done. Okay, this, we'll set this normalization constant in a second. Um, So let's compute the expectation. Uh, so we, we want that, again, at the end of the day, right, this is, you know, what do we want from here, right? We, we, we want, we specify G, so this definitely improves the runtime, but the question is, does it still preserve the dimension reduction properties, okay? So we want that vector Z uh, in L2 norm gives us the norm of Y. Okay, and just like in Johnson Lewis Rouse, you can, you can see what happens to one coordinate first. As in, you, you expect that, let's say, the L2 norm of one coordinate only is a rough approximation of the L2 norm of Y. I mean, or put differently, you can look at Z1 squared, and you would like that Z1 squared is roughly equal to the L2 norm of Y, okay, in some, in some reasonable sense. Okay. So you can compute, you know, this is, this is very similar to, you know, how you could analyze the general Strauss lemma, uh, except that, you know, we sparsify this matrix G with this uh, hash function H. Okay, so you compute the expectation of Z1 squared. Okay, so Z1 squared, you know, we have this eta squared that comes out in front. Then we have this summation, which is all squared. So this means that we have, you know, the summation of these things squared plus the cross terms. Now the cross terms, will involve different IAD Gaussians, so J and GJ, which I'm sure you have seen a few times earlier today, which zero out because they're independent Gaussians. So the only terms that remain are summation over I from one to D of this thing is squared. Okay, so we have HI squared, but again, HI is either zero or one, so it doesn't really matter. We have J squared, YI squared. Okay, what is the expectation? Well, by linearity of expectation, you know, we can switch these two things. Expectation of HI is exactly equal to S by N, right, just because we choose it to be equal to one of probability S by N. The expectation of J squared is one, this is Gaussian variable, and Y uh, squared is not random variable, uh, so it remains. So then we sum over all possible coordinates I, so this means that you know, we exactly obtain L2 norm of Y squared, okay? Plus the original normalization constant, plus this factor s divided by n that comes from using this hash function h. Okay, so now, you know, it only remains to set these normalization constants so that, you know, this disappears and the expectation of z1 squared is exactly equal to the L2 norm of y squared. Okay, so you set the right eta and, you know, voila, we get the right expectation. Okay, so this is, you know, you know so far very similar to how we analyze the general Schaus lemma. But, you know, the issue is that, well, you know, one also wants to get some concentration. Do we get the same concentration as for Johnson and Strauss? And the answer is no, we don't get the same concentration. And, um, you know, it should be easy to see kind of a, a, a bad example. So Z1 doesn't concentrate. And, you know, what, what is the bad example here, right? So, you know, forget the formulas. When does, when is this G a bad dimension reducing matrix? Again, G is very, very sparse. And there are 
you know, think of k as a constant, you know, let's say 100, k is equal to 100, let's say. And s is very small. When, when will this be a very, very bad dimension reducing matrix? Yes? Sorry? When g is all zeros, you say. Right, so I mean, we'll, well, let's say we choose s to be non-trivial. Let's say s is, you know, maybe root n or maybe a constant. Right, if g is all zeros, obviously, yes, I agree. But even when g, let's say, has, you know, 100 non-zero entries per row. When y is sparse, precisely, right? When, you know, if k is 100 and there are 100 entries per row, this means that the number of non-zero columns of g is, you know, 100 squared, independent of n, right? So this means that if y is sparse and there is just one entry in y, okay, then it will be very bad, okay? And, I mean, it, it, it fails kind of even, even worse than that, in a sense. I'll explain in a second why. What it means, so the bad case is really when y is sparse, right? Because multiplying a very sparse matrix by sparse y, this means that very few non-trivial products happening, actually, right? So we are very likely to miss just capturing information from y. Okay, so kind of the bad case is when y is, let's say, different between two basis vectors, right? So it has two non-zeros, okay? Even if we choose s, right? So first of all, the, the s, the, the sparsity per row should be chosen such that you know, there shouldn't be a column which is non-zero because a, a column of g which is zero, this means that we never look at that particular coordinate of y, which is bad, right? So suppose we choose s, which is, you know, at least so that, you know, every column of g is non-zero, which means s is roughly n divided by k, okay? It still can happen that two coordinates of y will collide uh, under basically this hash function um, with some non-trivial probability uh, basically something like one over k, um, and that's bad because, you know, they'll cancel out kind of in a, in a way that we don't expect, basically. Okay, so you can, you know, so s equals to n divided by k will kind of, you know, give some dimension reduction, but it's, it, the, pro the failure probability is too high. It's inversely, it's, uh, it's inversely polynomial in k as opposed to inversely exponential in k which is what we want to use it for, let's say, this oblivious subspace in many. Okay, so we want something which is exponential in k failure probability, right? And even, you know, to really get something like this one, you know, would need s to be equal to n when y is sparse, right? So there is no, uh, you know, no bad case happening. But the takeaway is that, well, okay, I mean, the bad case is when y is, uh, y is sparse. But what if y is dense? Well, if y is dense, then <coughs> just to go back, kind of, um, well, we have this summation, right? And in a sense, if, if y is dense, then this summation has many terms, and then you expect some kind of central limit theorem uh, to kick in, and you have much better concentration. So, you know, I, I don't want to go into details, but y you can think about that, you know, if y is, is much denser, then you're much more likely, kind of, you know, to to hit many of these non-zeros of the matrix G, and you know, then good things will start happening. So high concentration will start happening. Okay? So again, the, the takeaway you know, so far is that if Y is relatively spread around, then this method of specifying this Gaussian matrix G does work. Okay? Um, so to be the new plan, the new plan is like, well, how about we just take Y, we first somehow spread it around while preserving the norm, Right, remember that this is dimension reduction, we want to preserve the norm of vectors. So we want to spread around y. So what, what does it mean spread around? This means that you know, the, the y is not, is not sparse, right? The, the mass, the L2 norm or L2 mass of the vector y is spread around over many coordinates. Okay, or you know, formally I can state this as that an infinity norm of y is relatively small, much smaller than its L2 norm. Okay, uh, and then, you know, once it's spread around, then we can use a sparse G. Okay, how can we spread around Y while preserving its norm? This might be stupid, but can you, can you just add one and then normalize it? 
like add a unit vector? Uh, well, the normalization, so remember that the map shouldn't depend on y. When you do the normalization, it will depend on the, on the vector y. Right, what you described, is, I mean, is a valid way to take a vector y and, you know, transform it into something that will preserve a norm, but the map will depend on vector y. Think about, we want, we want to take y multiplied by some matrix, which is independent of y, so that it spreads around y but preserves its norm. Any, any ideas? Rocco is fine. <laughs> Sorry? So like a random rotation. Right, random rotation, yes. That's, that's, that's the first idea, yes. Basically, we take, you know, if we apply, we take a random matrix, let's say multiply Y by the random matrix, that will be random rotation. Random rotation, you know, generally means that Y will be kind of in general position. It's very unlikely that the output of this will be sparse. Okay, in fact, you know, if you take any vector, you apply random rotation, it will be like a Gaussian vector, which is very non-sparse. Okay, but then, you know, again, we are multiplying by random matrix, right? So, you know, there's, there's no progress so far. Um, okay, so the idea is to do this random rotation, again, not randomly, but pseudo-randomly, okay? Um, and this is how, you know, how we'll proceed to do this, right? Uh, so we'll multiply by, P, uh, by three matrices called PhD. You can tell it that this method was, uh, you know, a PhD student came up with this method. Um, and, uh, and this is how it works, okay? So we'll be this, this, to explain what are these three matrices, the matrix P is what we'll call projection matrix. This is the sparse Gaussian matrix, basically. Okay, applying to the spread around Y. And these, these two matrices A and G, uh, H and D have the role of spreading around Y. Okay, in particular, uh, e, e, uh, again, P is projection, it will be sparse, turns out that you have to choose this target dimension K prime a little bit higher, K, uh, K squared, um, but I mean, that's what comes out of the proof, but you know, you know don't, don't worry about it uh, as much as, in, you know, we don't get as good of parameters of dimension reduction, but you know, it still uh, has some uh, good properties. Now this matrix H is where, in a sense, all the action kind of happens. This is the Hadamard matrix uh, uh, or Fourier transform, and uh, uh, it, it has two important properties for us. One is that, you know, something which basically is called uncertainty principle, it has the property that if Y is sparse, then the output, of, so it is a rotation such that if Y is sparse, then the output will be dense. Okay, exactly what we want. Okay, and property two is that it is, again, uh, a non-preserving uh, rotation, which has the property that we can compute it fast. We can compute it faster than just multiplying a matrix by a vector. Okay, because it, you know, the Fourier matrix, and you can compute it in time, which is n log n. Okay, this is the fast Fourier transform. Okay, now, um, there is, you know, there is one issue remaining, and in particular, you know, why we'll need the matrix D. Can somebody tell me what, what is the remaining issue? Well, the, the issue is that, I mean, Hadamard, it's a rotation, right? Hadamard matrix is a rotation. It takes sparse things into dense things, okay? But, you know, this means that it also, there must be some inputs to this matrix, such that the output is sparse. Okay, it is, it is a rotation. So, uh, so the bad case so far is when Y's are such that H of Y is sparse, right? And in rotation, uh, so unitary matrix, this means that, you know, we can take a sparse, sparse vector and take its inverse, you know, there exists such a Y. Okay, and this is exactly why we need the matrix D. So D is a matrix which is diagonal. Uh, so it has non-zero only the diagonal, very simple to multiply with. And on each uh, element of diagonal, it's a random plus minus one. And it turns out that, in, you know, in a sense, the Y, the bad Y's that give H of Y as is sparse are in a sense, you know, killed or sufficiently randomized by this matrix D so that they don't give us such an output. Yeah, I mean, this requires a proof, right? You know, perhaps this should be, you know, this should be the most magical kind of aspect of this, that 
Well, somehow it is enough to take y and randomize the sign of each coordinate so that h of y is not sparse. Okay, so this is, you know, little magic it requires a proof. You know, we don't have time for that. Um, and, you know, it's also the reason, in a sense, why this sparse matrix P has to have dimension which is a little bit higher, something like k squared. Okay, so we are out of time today. We'll continue tomorrow morning. Are there questions about algorithms so far? Yes. Uh, what do you mean by a real world example? Okay. So I, I won't give, I mean, I, I won't give data sets and, and numbers and, you know, I won't show graphs saying, well, our graph is better than the other graph, kind of. Uh, well, other people have done that. And many of the methods that I mentioned have been implemented in, you know, both in kind of software packages and industry and, you know, are useful to, for speeding up algorithms. But uh, my focus is about talking about algorithms as opposed to, you know, talking about what kind of improved numbers they are. Uh, but if you're interested, I can give you pointers perhaps where people did talk more about implementation and kind of more practical aspects of that. But the algorithms, this is not just pure theory, right? Many of these things have been implemented and, and give uh, algorithms. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, if not, then see you tomorrow morning. <laughs>